that we're talking about. Oh, shoot. Be careful. You're being recorded oh, now. Oh, boy. Okay. Big brother. All right. No, it's <laughs> a little catch us. It's it's good little history. Little Please little mute. Little. Thank you. All right. Let's see. We're admitting it. I don't know, Charlotte Owens, Letterman. Yeah, yeah. You I'll put her? it on the record that I was there in, in 1982 in New York City, and it was so well organized. It is just amazing. These people just came out of the side streets and all these people, and I thought, where are they going to go after this rally? And New York is so big, they just people just disappeared. And, and there was James Taylor in the Central Park playing the piano. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, my bad. I leaned on something. You were like exciting me. I, I. That was. Yes, Pat. Yes. And we sent. I'm telling you that that weekend, Jan, June 12th in 1982, Columbus sent at least 10 buses. That the Sp Big Spring Peace Push uh, did. The Big Spring Peace Push. Speaking about community. That's. That was a development of a community aspect. Um, we have several folks that are going to speak to us today about what is community. Um, Kathy and Morgan and a few other folks went up to um, work for Nina Turner. Yeah, we're not Democrats, but we believe Turner is probably the best choice in this election. I mean, if, if you start looking at what's out there. I mean, you just have to look at the uh, General Assembly and where they're at. Uh, you have to just look at the US Congress and where they're at. Yeah, we're losing. Ohio is losing this year. You're right. You know, we're losing, what is it? We're losing one seat possibly because of uh, population decline. So this election is very important. So we'll get an update a little bit today about that. I want to start with a little bit of uh, you know, enticement, a little enticement, OK? Um, I'm going to share a screen. Oh, that's not the first one I want to show. That's not the second one I want to show. But. Um, Is everybody able to see this? Yes, no, maybe so. Did I share not, yet? Not yet. Oh, maybe I didn't share yet. No, stop. No, no, it said Mike, it said you had started screen sharing, but then it hadn't come up yet. So give it a give it a okay. minute. Give it a minute. Give it a minute. Okay. Okay, here we go. Oh, stop. There it is. Is it up there now? I see whiteboard. No, I don't want whiteboard. White. I don't want whiteboard. I want this one. My bad. People, I'm 61 years old, okay? I'm working with this technology as best as I can. And we all are, right? Does everybody see this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, sort of an exciting thing, you know, In These Times, have you ever heard of In These Times? It's a magazine that's sort of, you know, it's progressive, left. Um, I'm not saying it's any, any party affiliate. But the BLM took it over this this um, this uh, month, and they they they're offering this to be free. So if you want to order this, you can get it for free, and it would be a great teaching tool for anyone. So just so that you know, look at this, get it if you want, and it, I uh, I'll send the content how to get it, and Suzanne will send it out after the uh, salon. So don't worry about it if you don't know how to get it. Just, this is a very important reality, I think. Um, and they're very, very excited about it as well. So I haven't seen Morgan sign on yet. Um, He's here. Is she? Yes. Yeah, I'm on. Okay, good, good, good. And um, Kathy, both of you guys went up to um, Nina's activity. I, I uh, so be ready to present about your your both individuals, uh, but also that experience. But I wanted to start with something as well here. So um, everybody seeing this yet? Not yet. Hmm. I don't know if I'm sharing it. 
this way. You're not, it doesn't say that you're sharing. Okay, my bad, my bad. Guess what, I'm 61 years old. Okay, so I represent Community Organizing Center as well as the free press, free press, free press, always free press. You know, the, the, the contemporary, uh, the Institute, Columbus Institute for Contemporary Journalism Columbus Institute for Con Contemporary Journalism. Just think about that. We have had that uh, institution for 50 years, right? 50 I mean, years. Columbus, huh? Go ahead, Suzanne. I just said, yeah, 50 years. Yeah, so just understand, Bob and Suzanne have been the caretakers for the last probably almost 20 years, probably 15 at least. Yeah. And, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. But understand what tonight, tonight we're doing salon. We're doing a salon and it's to focus on one particular thing, which is not one particular thing. It's how community comes together and how community organizes to address problems, develop solutions, and push for power change. And so I just wanted to put this up. I represent Community Organizing Center. We had our first meeting in April 13, 1993. We'd been working many years before, but as an entity we came. But I just wanted this first, just paragraph, Let's just read that first paragraph. Critical to organizing is knowing the history of efforts that brought us to this point in time. Foundational to organizing are relationships that maintain and support community identification and self-determination. Interdependency based on self-interdependence and interest frames the motivation to organizing community. So, I just wanted to share that this conversation has been going on for many years. We have tried and filled many uh, experiences in this. So, um, I did want to uh, introduce Morgan Harper and uh, Kathy. Callan Becker, but Morgan has, and, uh, has uh, come to us in, and she can describe herself, but she was DC based, came to Columbus and was Columbus even before. I mean, uh, she can express herself and um, has come back and really has committed herself to building a better Columbus. So thank you. So thanks, if, Mark. If you're ready, Mark uh, Morgan, go ahead and do your thing. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it, the intro and the invitation to speak. Uh, and it's good to yeah be in community with everybody. And I think everything that we're doing uh, as part of Columbus Stand Up is certainly building on the legacy of a lot of folks on this call and otherwise who have been putting the work in as you're as you're saying mark for quite some time and the struggle is is long and it's a lot of work but it only is possible because people just keep building and staying committed and we keep learning from each other so that's ho i hope what we're, we're doing with columbus stand up um so yeah a little bit about me for folks who i haven't had the chance to meet before and I'm definitely looking forward to the chance when we can meet again in person uh we're getting closer but you know Variants are on the loose, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but yeah, I'm originally from Columbus. I'm actually in my uh, childhood home right now, so that's why I'm a bit on the go <laughs> with trying to find a good video setup at my mother's house. Um, and yeah, I've done a I've done a lot of different things. I had worked in Washington, like Mark mentioned, in pretty a formative pretty formative experience at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that just showed me the limits of good policy and a good agency and just the need for more aggressive politics. And that's what ultimately led me to run for Congress in 2020. And, uh, and you know, the campaign was 
trying to be a demonstration of a lot of what we already know that you can do amazing things when we come together and believe and put the work in and our, you know, people are kind of sick of the status quo. So we got to just like speak truth to power and get the message out and let people know that there are alternative ways of doing things and that we have the power. And I, and I do hope the campaign was successful and, and just continuing to spread that message to more and more people and especially younger people and working class people throughout our region. Uh, and, and when the campaign wrapped up, it was a top priority for me and for a lot of folks involved in the campaign to keep going, keep building. I think one of the biggest weaknesses of politics uh, has been, and maybe always, you know, folks on this call could probably speak to that better than I can. I did not grow up in a super political household, so limited, you know, historical reference there. But, um, but yeah, just this disconnect between the people and, you know, elections being about votes, but not really about service and trying to engage people in a consistent way all the time. And so launching Columbus Stand Up in the summer of 2020 was about letting people know this, this is ongoing and you can have a home here if you want to continue to organize and be involved and serve the community and really trying to get at that idea of politics rooted in service because that's ultimately my uh, origin into all of this. I was really more of a a volunteer community, you know, based organization person just through learning how the system works and how power works that I even got into policy and, and let alone politics at all. Uh, and so I want to, I want to, and, and I think a lot of people that have been part of Columbus Stand Up, we, we want to demonstrate to people that we can immediately add value to people's lives, that we can immediately, when we, when we come together, when we have resources, we can immediately make people uh, see tangible impact. And so, um, you know, Columbus Stand Up's done a lot of different things, but I'll just highlight one of the main ones, um, one of our main initiatives in the past year has been giving people rides. And to me, it's important to mention because it both demonstrates, uh, in my opinion, government failure of a lack of reliable transportation and affordable transportation for people. That it in, is a big issue in our region that folks can't get around easily, that it's regressive, that it hurts um, people who are earning lower incomes the most. And it becomes all the more pertinent when that's happening, when people you know, need to vote. That was when we first started doing it in the fall to get people to the polls. And in January, when the team was looking at, all right, what's the biggest need in the community right now? How can we be of service? Uh, and we, we decided, well, what if, what if we applied our rideshare program to vaccines? We know we're about to get all these vaccines. We know people can't get around. All the changes still exist. And we haven't heard any messages from our government about what the game plan is at the local, county, and you know, really at that point, even still the national level. And so let's adapt what we know and make it happen for our community. And we were lucky to have a volunteer who was part of the first uh, effort in the fall that was extremely grassroots, like Google spreadsheet grassroots and me, like on my computer trying to assign people the rides and this and that. That was a little stressful. Um, but he was like, you know, I think I can put together a better system here. And he has a developer background and he did. He kind of created like a, a great interface that was very easy. And we've had a lot of folks volunteer both as drivers and also matching people up with rides and ultimately did like 400 rides. So I knew we hit success when uh, Biden announced he was going to do a partnership with Uber and Lyft to basically do what we had done for like a couple thousand dollars at a grand scale is like great. Love the love the Biden administration uh, supporting companies that don't believe in labor rights, but that's another conversation. Uh, and so, yeah, that's just you know an example, one example of what we've been up to. Otherwise, we do a lot of community events in different parts of the city. Very much trying to be a model of meeting people where they're at come one, come all. This isn't an organization that's just for one person. And it's the same philosophy, again, that I, you know, I try to bring to politics. Or, and, I, and I think we all sort of believe in that. Um, and then also hosting citizen forums that focus <clears throat> on different topics. We've done a few with a couple of environmental organizations. Kathy was a part of those who I know we're also going to hear from. And really trying to bring attention to the city's climate action plan, which was something that, you know, they were keeping pretty low key under the radar, though pretty important uh, plan and document about how they are going to guide climate policy in the city over the next 30 years. And we wanted to make sure people had heard about that and knew about it, especially people in the black community that are often most impacted by some of these 
bad environmental policies. And, uh, and then otherwise, we have been also getting, and especially over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be focused on, uh, but we, well, all along, we've been supporting direct actions, but coming up on June 30th, we're working with a coalition of organizations that's going to be focused on bringing people together to uh, have a direct action related to housing. The CDC eviction moratorium at the federal level is going to expire, it appears, on and probably for good. That was put in place as a result of the pandemic on June 30th. And as a lot of folks on the call, I'm sure know, the housing situation in Columbus continues Mor to be- Morgan, can you say that again? Oh, sorry. The eviction, the eviction, the eviction moratorium is gonna end. It's going to end on June 30th, yeah, it, it you're, appears. You were saying things. I want the people to understand that the eviction moratorium is ending soon. Yeah. And all along, it's important to note that it's not totally clear how effective that's been in Columbus because we have landlords that don't really have a lot of, of accountability the county has continued to hold eviction proceedings at the convention center, which is going to be the location of where we're doing the action. And there's not a lot of transparency around that. And people don't have a lot of resources or an understanding of their rights about how to manage the eviction process. There are other grassroots organizations that have been doing a lot of good work on that. I don't know if Cohan has presented at the salon, but they've been canvassing people with who have received eviction notices with materials to educate them about their rights. But ultimately, you know, we don't have policies like uh, a right to counsel when you've received an eviction notice or uh, mandated uh, diversion programs so that people, you know, can't just immediately get evicted without, you know, any steps in between, uh, let alone broader and more systemic policies that, you know, would stabilize rent or increase the supply of housing in a more uh, accelerated way, in a way that's going to reach those that are either low income or, or lower incomes. And so we want to just bring more attention to that. It seems like one of the issues that a lot of folks are aware of because you, you know, pass the tents and maybe you catch a news story, but trying to highlight the stories of what it is to experience houselessness and, uh, and just navigate that. Um, and, and really force people to pay closer attention to how many people in our community are at risk there. So that's going to be on June 30th. And, um, and then, yeah, as, as Mark mentioned also, uh, even though I would say most people who are part of Columbus Stand Up or engage in what we're doing would describe themselves as progressive. It's certainly not a requirement or, you know, the uh, barrier to entry in any way. Uh, anyone is welcome to be part of what we're doing. But similar to, actually very similar to what Mark said. I, I you know, I'm no, uh, I'm not above critiquing the Democratic Party, even though I describe myself as a Democrat. And, and I believe that Nina Turner is uh, someone who, is as good as it can get for the 11th district right now. And we, think we can speak to this too. I mean, we just attended a candidate forum this morning, had about nine candidates, I believe, who were participating. And she blew everybody out of the water and really is just, you know, speaking in a more direct way and uh, able to like cut through the nonsense. And, you know, we also did door knocking after, and it feels like that's really where people are at in the streets that we were in in Akron, and we know people are there in a lot of places and parts of Columbus, but it felt even more even more dire and, um, and more urgent there to have someone who really is gonna treat, you know, having that seat, not just as a cushy step to a cabinet position, but about being a fighter and calling out injustice as often and as um, boldly as possible. So it was it was cool to get up there and get a sense of what her operation is looking like and meet people on the ground in Akron. That that's another learning for me over the past year. Columbus stand up uh, is also just being able to connect with more people in other parts of the state who uh, you know either like I said, whether you describe yourself as progressive or just like understand that we have some serious issues and we need to get to work on them in a, in a real way that's above partisan nonsense, um, you're, you have a home here. And, uh, and I wanna work with people like that that are just trying to get things done. So I'll pause there and happy well, to answer you. any questions. Thank you, Morgan. And yes, when we're developing community, that's, that's, the, that's the most, damning or most conflicting or most convoluted reality at the, the confliction of values, the conflict of values. 
when you do community organizing, it's very important to go into the understanding that you're not going to have uh, uh, the politics per se. There, there's, I mean, politics meaning ideology, whatever. Mm -hmm. So when you go into the community, you have to understand. And I wanted to uh, thank you, Morgan. What, and, and I would like you to stay active as, as you can. I'm going to introduce this piece, uh, share this piece. This is uh, sort of sort of models of community organizing or community, community, community in general. So everybody see this yet? Yes. Okay, thank you. Slideshow, slideshow, beginning from first. We're not gonna go deep into this because this is not a deep uh, uh, venue, right? It's, it's sort of a salon. A salon is where we celebrate, celebrate our power right? We celebrate our power of being a uh, progressive, independent, radical, left. We are part of whatever. So, but anyways, models of community organization. There's a locality development model, a social planning model, and a social action model. So I'm not going to get into deep on this, but this um, definition locality development model is a process designed to improve conditions of economic and social progress for the whole community with its active participants and the fullest possible reliance on the community's initiative, right? So there, how do you say this? There are different models and different problems that will come about democratic we need to think about when we're talking about organizing community. A voluntary cooperation, self-help, development of local, local indigenous leadership, not thinking outside the box. Everybody says outside the box. No, what is, what is capable? Education, all right? So there's Many things, and I'm not going to get deep into this because it's not what we want to do tonight, but I'm saying these are potentials and what community is, community is. And I'm going to stop sharing again so I can see exactly who is here, because some of our speakers may be here. Kathy's here, Pat Murad is here. Who else is here? Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, Stephen uh, sent that out. So, um, why don't we go with Kathy? Since Kathy was joined joined uh, Morgan up at Nina's activity, and Sandy will get you on too. Um, but Kathy uh, Cal Becker was up in Akron with Morgan. And, um, and actually, I spent um, time with her husband, Paul Becker, uh, today at the uh, BDS action. And sorry, but we do BDS. Sandy was there um, at uh, Kroger's uh, Northeast Broadway and High. So, uh, Kathy, are you trying to say something? Or we're going to jump to uh, Kathy. Um, sure. So I do have a little PowerPoint. Um, I'm just going to res respond to a couple of the things that you had said earlier. Do you have access to that? Do you are able to do that? Uh, I think so. Um, I'm just going to say a couple of things before I share that. Yeah, just about just community sure. and, and, what, and, and what Morgan was saying. Um, we did send a group of about 10 people up from Columbus to Akron today. And I totally concur with Morgan that Nina just blew them out of the water at this candidate forum. There were, were 11 candidates total and it was just kind of tedious to get through all of them. And it was clear a lot of them are just not ready for prime time. You kind of wonder why are you running against Nina Turner? Um, Dusty said, the, Dusty Eastep, a lot of you may know him, said it was like watching Jimi Hendrix at a middle school talent show. Um, 
But and Nina's doing very well in the polling, but that doesn't mean we can let up. Um, you know, someone asked me, Kathy Morgan and Morgan. Uh, someone asked me, how is Nina polling? I don't know. How is that? The last I saw, she had about 50%. And then the nearest person behind her was Chantel Brown, which is the establishment candidate, at 15%. So, you know, very well, Nina's polling very well, but, you. you know, it's, and, and she had more supporters at this um, candidate forum and, you know, it's, it's clear a lot of people really like Nina and Chantel is launching some negative campaigns that are just not landing. Um, some of them are, well, I could post a link to this afterwards or some of them are kind of ridiculous and, but they're trying to make the case that Nina is, can't be trusted because she's not in line with Biden. And it's kind of like, well, that's kind of exactly why Nina can be trusted because she tells it like it is and other, other candidates are not telling it like it is. Um, but I guess, and, and I'll show you a picture, actually, I'll go ahead and share, um, oops, share my screen. Um, I'm just going to go to the last slide because this is this is all of us who went. Uh, Devante's here, I think, and and Morgan obviously. And um, this is the group oh my gosh, the Kathy, you already got that in a PowerPoint. I'm <laughs> impressed. Wow. Yeah, this is a picture Paul took of the group before we watch out. She's too organized. She's too organized. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I have I have a lot of help. <laughs> it, it does help. So um, I guess I'm, my role here is to talk about just basically an update on what Simply Living is is doing in terms of community. But I guess I as will well, say as well. Yes. Is, yes. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because you are the ED. But your contribution to community, please speak larger than just one organization. Okay. 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 I will try to do that. Um, I just, having come into Simply Living, I've learned a lot about it, and you were talking about the history of organizing in Columbus, and Simply Living has been around 28 years, and in that time, um, interacted with a lot, I'm still learning the scope of other people and other organizations Simply Living has worked with, but we were fiscal sponsor of like kind of local matters. The organization started in the Simply Living offices many years ago. Um, Yoga on High, we are fiscal sponsors for them. Um, we helped start Keep Wayne Wild. Um, it's just somehow Simply Living has had a hand in so many other community organizations and in sponsoring them and not necessarily taking credit, although we do need to tell that story. And, you know, that's one thing we're, we're going to be working on as we move forward. Um, but we've really you know, I guess kind of tried to help other organizations get started or keep going or contribute just to multiply the effect and have all of us working together. And the mission of Simply Living is to promote sustainability, environmental awareness, and our local economy. It's about the local economy through education, educational outreach and partnerships in the community. So we're very Columbus focused. So um, just a few in Central Ohio focused, I'll say. So just a few updates. Um, we've welcomed several new people to our board and the latest person is um, Vicki Abugaliam. A lot of you may know her. She is one of the leaders of the Sunrise Columbus Hub, just an amazing person. Um, she's getting her PhD in environment and natural resources at Ohio State and um, you know, kind of one of the young, like really dynamic voices that we are very happy to have on board. Um, here's where I'm going to <laughs> betray that I'm not necessarily so greatly organized because I haven't turned in my story yet for our new newsletter, which is why there's just dummy text there, but I'm sending that in tonight. And this newsletter will be on the stand soon, um, in the next week or so, promoting mainly our garden tour, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, one big piece of news is that I think last time I was here, we talked about the People's Solar Project and said we were applying for a grant. Um, to Compass for that project, and we got that grant. That was a big, huge, wonderful piece of news. Um, so we have a blog post um, about the People's Solar Project. It's basically to build community solar in Columbus, which um, is, is really hard to do in like an AEP territory, but we're going to try to work with the city 
the city owned utility, they can do community solar, um, you know, like by state state law. We don't, Ohio doesn't have community solar enabling legislation that kind of forces the for-profit utilities to do it, but the city utilities can do it. Um, so we got a grant from Comfest of 2345 to mainly go to building one of these sole poles, the, these um, take the solar panels off the ground and put them onto kind of a solar tree. And the person whose vision this is, his name's Art Yoho. Um, there's a video where we have a very, I won't play it now because it's eight minutes long, but um, he kind of talks about the People's Solar Project there. Um, and also we have a blog post about it. Um, so there we go. And Art's video is available there too. I mean, it's just like an eight minute interview, but this blog post has a lot of the text from the grant application. So you'll be able to read all about it. Um, this is the area where off of Cook Road, where this community solar project is envisioned to go. Um, so, and if we are able to build a community solar project here, or if, basically if art is able to, that can become a model for other community solar projects around the city. And especially if we can get the city owned utility on board, um, once they do it, like, you know, it's gonna be a process to get them oriented to, this is something you should do and you need to build out, you know, have your grid able to deal with solar. And, but once that's done in one place, it can be replicated in other places. And we really like to see this in the communities of color and the, and the low income and the opportunity communities in Columbus. So going back to this, um, so that, that was one big piece of news we've had is, is we got that grant. Um, and thank you, that, that's a great contribution to the potential. Remember, community power or community identity, community sustainability is based on energy. And if, if the outside, I mean, it's colonialism all day long, if you really want to think about it. I mean, if you really want to speak about it. Sorry, Kathy, go no, ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. However, whatever you want to say, Mark, go jump right in, go right ahead. Um, I'm just going to go through a few of our upcoming events. Um, we're about community sustainability and education. So there's several sort of educational events. Um, we have a tree identifying event that's two Wednesdays, this coming Wednesday and the one after that. Um, and we have this uh, marketplace website, give.simply.org, that we're kind of using as an event sign-up tool until, until we get our new system, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but you can sign up there for this. And this looks like it's going to be a really popular workshop. Um, this person will basically tell you how to identify all the different trees in Ohio. We also have on June, oops, on June 30th, um, Alyssa Yoderman from the Ohio Sierra Club is going to present about Break Free from Plastic. And, and what can be done about plastic pollution. This is something she's worked a lot on for oh, the last year or at least year or maybe two. And then in July, on July 24th, this is kind of a, a, I guess, core event for Simply Living is the Sustainable Living and Garden Tour, which had to be suspended last year, but it's back and it's gonna be in person. And there's eight venues with all kinds of gardens and um, some solar um, demonstrations and electric vehicle demonstrations. And I'm still learning about all the community gardens in Columbus, so I'm very interested in this. Um, we do charge $10 for that, although if you absolutely cannot pay, just let us know. And if you, but if you wanna put in 25, you'll get a Simply Living membership. That's the cost of the membership. Um, we have a book club starting up. Um, this is the first one, Global Warming Can It Be Stopped? Um, we don't have a date and time of the author talk yet, but we will, and that'll be publicized. But if you want, you can get the book now and start reading it. I've also got an explainer about um, the energy aggregation. So I've been getting a lot of questions from people about the Clean Energy Columbus program, um, and some people with some wrong information about it. Um, so I actually wrote a piece and submitted it to the dispatch like a month ago, and they've told me twice they're going to run it, and they haven't run it. But Columbus Underground did run an explainer that somebody else wrote, but they talked to me a lot about, and so 
if you'd like to, you can probably just find it on the Columbus Underground site. This is a direct link. Um, and that that should have answers to several questions and I could try to answer some questions here. So Kathy, know. just one, two seconds. Uh -huh. I, I got a, a bill from uh, uh, Columbia Gas, I guess. I guess it was, or AP, I forget which one. Uh -huh. but, but they said, you are now a member of because your people voted for aggregation. Yeah, that would be AP. That's not, yes, oh, okay, AP. So are you able to opt out or do you just stay in without a question? How does that work? Um, you can opt out anytime. They gave, there was an opt out period because they want to kind of know who's in, who's out. And so they send out opt out letters, which everyone should have gotten one who's eligible. Not everyone is eligible. Um, but if you are, you should have gotten an opt out letter and you could, uh, you, they were hoping people would opt out in three weeks, but if you want to opt out, you still can. Um, we're urging people to stay in because this program is being leveraged to build out 700 megawatts of solar. I'm sure wind here, but really it's mostly solar energy mm -hmm. in Ohio, which will substantially cre clean up the Ohio grid. It will create a lot of jobs. It will improve health. And the other thing that this program does is built in is it's generating about $1.7 million a year for community grants. And they're going mm -hmm. to use these grants for things like actually helping low-income people to say buy more um, efficient appliances or do weatherization on their homes and getting landlords to do upgrades because a lot of people who are low-income rent and they pay the bills the energy bills whereas the landlords don't so the landlords don't have an incentive so with ready for 100 we talk to the city like constantly about you got to get these landlords to do the upgrades to lower people's energy bills and and that's part of the grant program and they're also talking about establishing like a green fund green bank type, type program with some of this money so the aggregation program is really like a value added program um, and so we're we're encouraging people not to opt out but if you want to opt out you can at no time with any penalty i mean at any time with no penalty sorry Okay. Uh, two people with their hands up, uh, Charles Trailer and Bob Cousin. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, oh, yes, yeah. this is Charles. I just wanted to address, the, you know, the question that I uh, wanted a discussion about the AEP aggregate. I did opt out, and the reason I opt out, Kathy, was that I found out that it is not a fixed rate, that it will, um, it will increase um, over time and just like with my mortgage you know i have a fixed rate on my mortgage because i didn't want my mortgage to always go up all the time so that's the reason why i opted out because so, i just didn't yeah. feel yeah so, so the yeah, concern I, I would about, like to address that so the concern about the balloon because that is a, a message out there that's, about the that's actually potential. yeah that's actually misinformation that, yeah. that is not true. So the rate for the Clean Energy Columbus right now is 5.499. That will change after two years, but because we are moving to renewable energy, the cost of renewable energy has nowhere to go but down. The cost of solar has literally, literally fallen 99.5% since the 1970s. And I don't know, many tens of percentages like since the 19, like in the last 10 years. Whereas the cost of fossil fuels, which is the regular rate, that has nowhere to go but up. Frack wells are gonna run dry. There's, you know, like, like the fossil fuel, that cost is gonna keep going up. The solar cost is gonna keep going, coming down. Um, and also the, what's called the rate to, or the price to compare from AEP has been artificially low because of the pandemic and, and because of these fossil fuels, that, that rate actually went up, oh gosh, quite a percentage. It went from 5.0 cents to 5 point, almost 5.4 cents from May to June. It went way up. And so the current rate for Clean Energy Columbus, I would probably, like I've measured it for my house and the amount of energy we use, and I might pay a dollar more a month for Clean Energy Columbus, but you know, I'm willing to do that because it, because of all the extras that I mentioned that it does, that it brings in clean energy, that it 
produces all these money, all of this money for community grants. And, and that rate is fixed for at least two years. Um, and then it's probably gonna keep going down. The idea that it's gonna balloon or this idea that it's 20% more, 100% more, it's not true. It's, it's just not true. Yeah, thanks, Bob's, Bob's on message. But um, yes, the, the issue for us as free press, we're not the instigators of this. We'd support it. We're not the uh, regulators of this, but we are gonna moderate and mediate and report on the progress of this Absolutely. process. Please and do. Energy aggregation is a new concept to Columbus, Ohio. And we need to make sure it's done correctly. I was told by my babysitter, who many people know only as the, the, the Senate president, but I'm not gonna tell who she was. But anyways, she said, always tell us when the, the gaps of the policy are. When the policy is not working, tell us. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, hopefully GOP is still there. Hopefully GA is still there in Ohio. So. But thank you, Kathy. Uh, Bob, you have a question or an answer, please. Hi, Kathy. Um, I'm a proud owner of solar on my roof and it, uh, from March to September, uh, there is no electricity paid for. Now we're still paying fixed charges, but uh, there's no electricity. Uh, the question I have is there is a lot of opposition in the legislature to wind and solar. Uh, how is that going to affect aggregation if this is passed? Um, and especially the solar, I don't know, especially the wind. Uh, mm -hmm. How are we going to get around this wind stuff that's already in place with the setbacks? Yeah, that is a really good question. I have asked them that very same question. And the wind energy in Ohio or industry in Ohio has been really damaged. The setbacks, as Bob mentioned, there's a bill in the legislature right now that would basically undermine the entire solar industry. So what would happen is if those bills passed, um, there would still, there is still a little bit of wind development and there would probably be a little bit of solar development, but the uh, for the Columbus Aggregation Program, they are on 100% renewable now, but it's through offsets. And so, or through what's called renewable energy certificates. So for every like, I know a kilowatt hour of energy we use in Columbus, the city would buy that much renewable energy somewhere else. And so it's not the same as local because you're sending your money somewhere else, but at least it supports renewable energy in general, helps bring down the price nationwide for everyone. Those programs are part of why the price keeps falling for renewable energy because there is a demand for it, but it wouldn't support renewable energy here but probably the city would not be able to do the whole 700 or might not be able to do the whole 700 megawatts that the program is seeking out with Ohio solar and wind. They just might have to keep buying more offsets. Is the plan for a Phoenix golf course still on? Do you know? I believe it is. Yeah. Is that the one that's on the, on the um, landfill? On the landfill. Yeah, that is still on. And the city is going to use that. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And, and there are it, some solar- And that's um, been a golf course for 20 years, so. Yeah, and there's a couple of solar, like Atlanta, Atlanta Fields, I think it's called. There's some that have made it through the process before this legislation is was proposed that the city already contracted with, or AEP already contracted with. So, you know, they might be able to get the 700. Um, I'm just not sure, but if they can't get it all, they would just continue to buy offset. It would still be 100% renewable. It just might not all be local. It sounds like the question that Bob had was he set up things and it's not working evidently or something. What was that? I don't understand. What? Please. Well, I, you know, solar is solar and wind are both under attack at the Ohio legislature. Yeah, of course. Um, they are. And um, people, I, people I, are under attack. I'm going to try to see. I, want, I wanted to try to see how the workarounds are going to work for that. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, AEP is on board with uh, aggregation. 
I, oh, I, yes, sense, that I, I sense that they are very much. Yeah. Um, but I hope they stay on it because that's going to be what's needed. That's like almost their new business model, honestly. <laughs> um, and 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 they are they have a company commitment to move to at least eighty percent and might be a hundred percent renewable by twenty fifty. Um, so this is and they started that because they did they did renewable energy for Google and then for the Columbus Airport and then they started. From what I heard, um, in twenty oh eight there was a move to try to get Columbus to move to agri. Four hundred communities in Ohio have aggregation of either electricity or gas or both. So Columbus is kind of way behind the times. A lot of other communities are hundreds are already doing it, although most of them are not for one hundred percent renewable. Um, but I I heard that there was a move to try to move Columbus to aggregation, like in two thousand and eight or so, and that AEP kind of said, "No, we don't want to do that." And so then yeah, was the city backed off. It was two thousand five, and uh, from the priorities, uh, mm -hmm. two thousand five thing. But yeah, two thousand eight was when we actually was were able to present legislation to adjust that. Oh that, wow! You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah, but now AEP is totally on board and is obviously against this legislation in, at the state house. And, you know, the whole solar industry turned out, a lot of business people turned out and a lot of farmers turned out and said, if I want to lease my land to solar, I should have, be allowed to do that. It's my property. Like yeah. what you could consider more conservative arguments are turning out to say, we want to be able to do this. And that by itself should have been enough with the Ohio legislature to yeah, the, 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 new, the new discussion is very good. I mean, for some of those farmers, I mean, that mm -hmm. could be constant income. If yeah. They, if they planted a, a whatever, let, let's just say a, a windmill, but then also thought that there is an ongoing electronic or, or, or utility experience beyond that. They're, they're, yes. Go ahead, Stephen. What'd you say, please? They have a 107 megawatt thing planned out here in Harrison Township in Lincoln yeah. County right now. They just paid for their application, the company did, and it's been, they've had hearings and all that. So, would that be included in? Uh, apparently, a lot of these things are going up around Ohio for Amazon and big companies to write off their electricity usage so they're they're getting credits for it if they buy into these plans but can is that incorporated into the aep thing that's going on or will it be when it's online if it happens it's still has yeah been let's, let's let's sort of move towards the conversation that pat is going to include in this building of what community might be pat morita mm -hmm. Uh, Kathy, did you finish up okay, good? Before um, I have one more thing to go yeah, over please, to let you all ahead. know about. Please, please. Um, and that is our capital campaign. Um, so when I came into Simply Living, I discovered most nonprofits have like a data management system that you use to just track basic memberships, send emails, uh, manage event registrations, you know, maybe run a marketplace, which we have. And we were using an, an open source system that had all kinds of security holes and just would decide at any given time not to send an email to two thirds of the people on the email list. And that's been causing a lot of the communications problems. And so we did some research and, and found a database that a lot of nonprofits, small nonprofits like us use called Donor Perfect. And so we're trying to assemble the money to buy three, pay for three years of that up front because that'll give us the security of having a system and knowing we have it for three years. We get a bunch of free months and some big discounts if we can pay that much. So if you have been or want to be a member of Simply Living, I would just say now is a good time to up, re-up or up your membership. It's $25 for an individual. Um, I think it's 40 or 50 for a household or $10 for a student or a senior. Um, it's you know a reasonable cost and you'll get our newsletter. And, and help us get this new system so that we can communicate with you and build, you know, we can build the kind of community, like, like an organization's operating system is, is kind of the foundation of how it operates. And, and the one Simply Living has is just not functional. So we're trying to move to a new one. Yes, thank you. That's all I've got. 
And, and thank you for getting back, you and Morgan, getting back from uh, the AKRON and uh, getting back to the CBUS. Um, very important to keep you both here, okay? Um, I appreciate everybody. Pat, you basically have been keeping us up to date with what's going on at the Ohio General as then assembly. I, I don't even think it, I can call it an assembly, but that's what they call themselves. Uh, please uh, update us with your knowledge, please, your, your experience. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. And I sure followed two powerhouse speakers here with Morgan Harper and, and uh, Kathy Cowan Becker, and I just want to acknowledge and, and thank them both. And I did put something in the chat about this Senate Bill 52, which would, the, the title is Revised Law Governing Wind Farms and Solar Facilities. And that actually allows jurisdictions to hold referenda on industrial wind and solar. And as, as Kathy said, it would effectively stop, they won't, they, why would they invest a lot of money if they don't even know whether their proposal is going to uh, 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 go through? So uh, call your house member. Please do. Everybody do that. Uh, I'll talk about some other legislation. Uh, right now, um, there's, there's one called House Bill 201, uh, and that would prevent local governments from limiting the use of natural gas. So isn't that interesting? You know, uh, they, want, they want to pick and choose what utilities are, can, um, can operate in Ohio. By local governments are forbidden from uh, stopping the pipelines and fracking, but hey, you may not have wind and solar. So, I, so the um, Senate, <coughs> Energy and Public Utilities Committee is going to have a hearing on this. Uh, it's for um, for opponents, that, and uh, I'm going to put information how to, if you want to write some testimony about that, send it in before 10 o'clock on Monday, and along with a, <clears throat> a witness form. And I'll, I have a link to the witness form, and I have the address of the, uh, of the person to send the comments to, Mackenzie Uxley. Uh, she's uh, um, uh, the aide to the Senate chair, uh, the committee chair. Uh, so I'll put that, I'll see if I can get that in there right now. Um, uh, let's see. What, thanks, Pat. Well, I, whatever, I, have a, I have a little bit more. If I know you do. Uh, <laughs> and and um, I'm not cutting you off, but if, if anyone needs to find what she's talking about. It will be extended into what Suzanne puts out, right? Correct? After what, what, what happened, what happened at the Free Press, right, Suzanne? Except for people have to get their testimony together by Monday. They should write down what that is out of the chat today because I likely will not uh, get this together until tomorrow night, which doesn't hear you. a lot of time. Yeah, thank, thank you. I just wanted to make sure because you've been beautiful at sending out the reflection of what happens at the salon. And, 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 and <laughs> Bob, I'm touching you on my forehead because it's so good to see you. But thanks, thanks, Pat. And you got more? Please. Yeah, so thanks to Suzanne for doing it. She does a great job of writing all this up. But yeah, send your testimony uh, before 10 o'clock on Monday to Mackenzie. And then there's, and you send that along with a witness form. And the testimony, well, they like it to be in a PDF. I, uh, I'll mention that too. So a couple other things I'll just mention. Uh, there's a bill that uh, it says, uh, 117, and the title is Repeal Legacy Generation Resource Provisions of House Bill 6. What that does, it repeals the bailout for the two uh, Ohio Valley <clears throat> coal plants um, at, uh, that were in House Bill 6. And as you know, the nuclear bailout has already been uh, reversed, and that was because First Energy wanted it to be reversed. 
because of the uh, the federal uh, the FERC, the Federal Energy and uh, uh, what is it? Co uh, Commission uh, Regulatory Commission uh, passed a rule that said that Ohio that the state of Ohio uh, or, or that that uh, in the auction that that um, that any utility that has gotten a subsidy uh, will have to charge a higher price. So that would have put First Energy out of competition for their electric. So that they wanted to have the uh, nuclear bailout overturned. So yay, it's an overturn. But the coal is still there and the deep sixing of the renewables is still there. So, um, so that's uh, 117, I don't think it has a very good chance of passing because I don't think the legislature wants to pass it. They want to support coal. Uh, there's a bill there that also that would allow brine from oil and gas operations to be sold as a commodity and you could you can then you know uh, put it down as a de-icer on your sidewalk, all this toxic, toxic, very toxic stuff. And then there are um, there are bills that would make protesting a crime, and I'll put something about that on just. Yeah, please, Pat. Pat, uh, that that um, yeah, we we that was something that's always been on the agenda because you know we are always protesting, we're always doing mass action, hopefully mass action. <laughs> a lot of times you're like puny, but anyways. Um, we do need to pay attention to what the General <clears throat> Assembly, and I, I use that word in very uh, associated manner, um, can pull out. I mean, the politics that may play out, they could make things, even just showing up to a demonstration, as being a, uh, a violation of politics and, and criminality, let alone, I, I, they, I know they want to develop a nonviolent versus violent, whatever that term violent is, uh, definition. But I do want, um, as you're answering that question, I, I'm going to share a, a, uh, a video from Honduras. And they've collected themselves, even though their their people have been killed. Uh, Caceres, I don't know if you know her, but she'll be mentioned. Mm -hmm. She was killed defending community uh, 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 in the in the face of of uh, as Kathy said, the the um, energy energy sources that really have their eye on people and, and, and community. And so how do we do, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, we're, we're predominantly white folk here. How do we deal with environmental racism, environmental justice? I mean, uh, and I wanna share this one thing, but um, go ahead, Pat, please finish and, and, and then we'll move on to this. Yeah, okay, well, that was really all I had to say. There's two bills that would, uh, one has already passed the Senate uh, that would uh, do, yeah. do different things that would uh, criminalize uh, criminal. Uh, and uh, I should have written all of them down, but I don't have them at my at my There's fingertips. There's too many of them, so. Yeah, well, many. it's pretty, you know, uh, insulting or yelling at an, a, a police officer would yeah. be one of the an example yeah. uh and, and then last but not least you know we did uh uh they passed a, a bill that would um establish the legislature could have oversight over the governor and the ohio department of health as far as any uh regulations over what to do in, in an epidemic so that's passed so the legislature now has knows better than the Department of Health about epidemics. So anyway, um, thanks for having thanks. me and um, oh carrying uh, on. Pat, Mark. Pat, 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 you're not with us, you are us, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So don't don't even think about that. Okay. So Sandy, Sandy, you wanted to put in a little thing about. Uh, we talked a little bit about that this mm -hmm. afternoon. If you don't have time, if you have time, please tell us, please. I do. I'm sending it now. Um, as you know, I always advertise what we're doing um, with Move to Men to Ohio and in our um, um, Speaking of Democracy series that yeah. started when the pandemic did shortly afterwards. And so I promised one minute. So I'll, I, I sent you it. I just sent it in a text or in a chat. Um, the Rank the Vote is our next, will be our next presentation. And that's um, Thurs this Thursday, coming Thursday, June 17th from seven to eight. It's just one hour. And um, our speaker is with Rank the Vote Ohio. His name is Justin. He does a great job. And um, if you can come, ask your questions, hear what this is all about. Um, Move to Men has decided to endorse this, this movement. I don't know if Justin knows this yet or not, but we will let him know. <laughs> so you so, said um, HB 201 is what we're moving for. Is that what you said? No, no. Where, where is it? Oh, no, that's what Pat sent out. Rank the vote. Yeah. Where? It, um, I, 806. 806. Send, send some send other ones. In. Just send that to the chat, please, because then yeah, we'll be it, able to. It's in, but I can send it again. Oh, well, maybe, I just sent it. I'm sorry. I just saw Pat's. There you go. Oh, there it is. I, I got it. I see it. <laughs> so just so that Suzanne will have a record and, and, when she is able, she will do. Yeah, this is also on page uh, movetomend.org. You can find it there in upcoming meetings in Central Ohio. Um, yeah, come. These are always really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Rome has a question. Yeah, Bob Rame, please, please. Rame. Yeah, this can is. You, can you can you le elevate your left left hand? No, that's your right hand. <clears throat> Make it match up to the yellow. And that's the, oh my God. <laughs> no, I'm, just yeah. I'm sorry, Bob, go for it. This is in response to what Pat just said about the state legislature wanting to have oversight about the Department of Health and the governor and all that. There's a group called Disability Rights Ohio that advocates for people with disabilities and they often file lawsuits. They yes. used to be specifically part of the Ohio government and they kind of separated themselves. Yes. Now the Ohio legislature wants to create an oversight board consisting of legislative members that could potentially limit their ability to file lawsuits, for example, against the state of Ohio. Yes, so... Um that's a, a put out there that that's a knowledge that that's happening or is there some policy we can work with? I don't know. Unfortunately. Because, yes, I hear you and I know that's happening. I know that's happening. I got an email message about it and I can't really answer questions whether it's yeah. active legislation or if it's already passed or what, what the status is. But when Pat talked about this oversight for the Department of Health and the governor, I immediately was reminded of what I'd heard directly from um, yeah. people, excuse me, Disability Rights Ohio. Is that right? Did I say that right? Yeah, you, you, got, you got all those folks. Yeah. But so yeah, they're, they're hmm. building community, we have to build community, right? They're, they're, I mean, we have to be the ups and the downs of who it is. I mean, we got people that are in families. We have people that are in families in, I mean, let's get real. Define what a family is, okay? Can you give me a list of what is a family? That I did that about 30 years ago in my church, St. Andrew Presbyterian, and we came up with three three poster board uh, sheets of what a family could be. So yes, when people start talking about you gotta be a family, let's, def let's little define what that is. So, and I want to end some with uh, some inspiration. I, I was hoping Lynn would be on. Is Lynn on? I don't see her. Yeah, so this is what she was hoping we would play. 
So I'm gonna put this on. Am I sharing yet? Just so no. you I'm not, sharing yet. I'm not sharing yet. That's what I need to do. We can hear it. You got it? Oh, shoot. I can hear it. Okay, so I am sharing then. Okay, here we go. My bad. Colombia es muy grande 100%. Tiramos como un bar, quedamos en un momento. Así somos los latinos, nos quedamos bien por dentro. Respiramos como peces y nadamos en el viento. Welcome, everyone, to the Children Thrive Action Network kickoff event. I heart my immigrant family. My name is Paula Ramos, and I will be your host today. We'll be hearing from members of Congress, journalists, from entrepreneurs, musicians, activists, and Columbus crew, from baby. All parts of the world. As an immigrant who came to this country alone at the age of 16, this conversation is a particularly meaningful one for me. We love our mommy and poppy. We love our grandparents. I love mommy and papa. Hi, my name is Daishi Miguel Tanaka, and I'm a Filipino-Japanese DACA recipient. My name is Mutanda Kwasele. I was born in Zambia, and my family moved to Seattle, Washington when I was four years old. As the proud son of immigrants from Mexico, it's my honor to represent California in the United States Senate. Hi, my name is Claudia, and I'm from Mississippi. The reason why people need citizenship and my mother needs citizenship it's because people need help. Hola, mi nombre es Alexa Garcia y es un placer estar con ustedes hoy. I'm a professional poet and musician. I'm a filmmaker, I'm an activist, I'm a writer, I'm an educator, and I'm a sub-top visual artist. Dignity, equality, and fairness for all are what we can and we must aspire to for ourselves, our children, and the generations to come. That is why I support the Children Drive Action Network in their pursuit of healthy families and community. Now, I have two beautiful kids that uh, I left behind, a daughter and a son, and I want to be able to get back to them by any means. All of us together can change the world, but to do that, we need your help. I love my immigrant life and everything it's given for me and given to me, and I give my immigrant life to you. Uh, thank you. And then uh, there's others that I wanted to show, but I'm not sure how much people are interested in keep them going. Mary Jane and uh, uh, Mary Jane Borden has a presentation and um, Ju Julie, Julia, Julia Whitney as well. Is she on, uh, Tim? You're muted. Yeah, um, she had an emergency. Uh, yeah, so okay. Uh, okay. But, uh, so we just want to make, make sure. an announcement though. Okay. So we'll have you and then and we'll we'll, we'll uh, do the, you after um uh, uh, uh Mary Jane. Okay? Please. It's good. Okay. Mary That's Jane, good. please. Um right. Mary Jane. Oh, my my bad. <laughs> I love you. No, I, get a I lot love of that. your name. <laughs> I love your name and your politics and everything you do. Okay. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint presentation because my topic was dovetailing with my uh, recent article uh, that the Free Press published. I, I, mm -hmm. I write articles now under the uh, moniker of Mary Jane's Guide. I, I've been doing this work for over 20 years, as I know Bob and Suzanne will attest because I started working with them earlier in the 2000s. So that's why where I have this level of expertise. And Can you I put it, put it up? Okay. Sorry. Have you been able to put it up here? Can you share? I'm it? just getting to that, please. Okay. okay? If yeah. you if you would like me to, to do that, that's where I'm where I'm coming from. If yeah, you please. Want me to go please. ahead and do please. that. Please. So I could share my screen if uh, you're ready. I'll say my presentation to Steve. Take about 10 can you minutes. get that? I apologize time, please? for that. What? I was asking again, Steve to make sure that happened, please. Yeah, she can share. Everybody can share. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, here goes. 
Okay, so like I said, I'm trying to say this dovetails with my article uh, that under the name Mary Jane's Guide. So you can look at it there on the Free Press website. Um, and I guess I, we could find a link. Susan, will get Suzanne a link for it and put it in the transcript. So here's my presentation. Okay. Okay. Um, can you, you can see this and you can hear me? Yes, please. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Pending cannabis legalization legislation, and we could really call it legalization because that's the aim of uh, what's be, what we want before uh, any type of legislated body. So um, let's start the first thing here. Like I said, this uh, goes toward my article in Mary, uh, Mary Jane's Guide, and it's uh, called "Pending." There's pending cannabis legalization legislation, and what I did to. Um, put this article together, at least this part of the article together, was to create three data tables. Now, one is for the federal, one is for the state of Ohio, and the one is what we call the local decrims, and I'll get to that in a minute. So looking at the federal table, this is just a mock-up of the table. Now, if you go to my article uh, and on the, on the Free Press website, uh, on the first line, there will be uh, links to the three tables. So you can look at the data tables on your own, we don't have to do it now, but the, what you're seeing there is just kind of a little screenshot of the data tables to show what they look like. Okay, taking a look at those state, the, the federal legislation, and I've gleaned this from searching congress.gov for the, all the terms of marijuana. And remember, legislation will have marijuana with an H in it. This goes way back to the early, to late 19, to the 1930s. Uh, and it was kind of, I think, a slur on the Hispanic population at the time. So, but all legislation you'll find is under marijuana with the H in it, including Ohio. Other terms, search terms would be cannabis and hemp. And so right now, introduced into the United States House and Senate are 36 bills that pertain to cannabis and marijuana, okay? All right, the first and most important one is gonna be called the Moore Act. And Moore Act has been introduced several times by Representative Gerald Nadler, who's the Democrat from New York. The most recent introduction is on the 28th, of, which is about last week. Now, this bill passed the Ohio House, not the Ohio House, this bill passed the House of Representatives last year, and I think it was probably December. A little late in the game to be actual legislation, but it was groundbreaking because it was a very broad legalization bill, nonetheless, that got passed the, the, the House. It stalled in the Senate because Mitch McConnell had 300 bills on his desk that he never brought to the floor of the Senate. Uh, the important, most important parts of the Moore Act, I think, are to removing cannabis from this control. CSA is called the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, it's where it has it under Schedule Schedule One, which is like the worst possible drugs there are in the world, you know, heroin, et cetera, et cetera. So the most important part of the Moore Act is to remove it from what we call the CSA entirely, eliminate criminal penalties, expunge records, and um, there's other things to it, but uh, one of the things that's probably going to catch in the craw of the Republicans is a tax which would fund a trust fund for social equity. That being said, okay, so I just want to quickly overview that, the, the features of the Moore Act. Now, there are other important bills that have been introduced as well. Um, the most important, I think, would be the Safe Banking Act. Um, if you recall my uh, series, I've written so many articles for the pre-press, some 50 of them. But I think in 2018, one of the big ones that I wrote was called um, after, happened, after Huntington Bank forced closed my account because I happened to work uh, as an advocate for cannabis in Ohio. So I, don't, I didn't have a banking account after 40 years being with Huntington. Now, that particular ba uh, Safe Banking Act would take care of things like that and allow banks to do business with cannabis businesses. The Claim Act, believe it or not, cannabis businesses have to do everything in all cash. I think you know that, and that's because the Safe Banking Act, why Safe Banking Act is necessary. They can't get insurance either. This particular bill here would get them insurance. Now, I'm not going to walk through all of the rest of them, but what these bills are are companion House and Senate versions. So if any one of them to pass, they would go to reconciliation between those two versions and head to President Biden's desk. Um, it's going to be some, I don't know, I think it's tough to say whether he'll actually uh, sign a bill that has to do with cannabis or not. Uh, he can't get through his signature 
um, he get the signature bills through the uh, Senate. So it's wondering if he would do something as, contra cites as, something as controversial as cannabis. I only point out the last bill on that list there because that's one that does, again, removes cannabis from the uh, Controlled Substances Act. But it is also sponsored by a Republican, and that's David Joyce uh, from District 14, which I believe is somewhere north around Akron, Canton area. So I'm going to move away from now from the, these bills. These are bills in, you know, in the, in the um, legislature, you know, the, the U.S. So, House, U.S. So Senate. So Mary Jane, you said they're bills. That means they're proposed. There is no law yet. The law, as it stands, is yeah, the please. Controlled Substances Act, which places marijuana in Schedule One, yeah. and um, calls it, you know, um, just among heroin and those other it's things. Like, but it's there's like so many, many saying, fallouts for being in Schedule One that I could go into. That'd be a whole another three or four PowerPoints sure, to do sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. But that's the so governing just, law federally right now. Yeah, I just wanted to let everybody understand that it's still illegal and blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. thank you. It is illegal at the federal level. Let's be clear on that, okay? Yeah. Um, I just want to cover federal real quickly one more time because a lot of ha Thanks. things that happen that allow us to operate dispensaries and things like that in Ohio yeah. and other states are two appropriations amendments yes. that have perennially been a part of the uh, budget process. Yes. You know, the, the, the House can control what things get funded what things are not getting funded is uh, uh, actions against state level uh, cannabis, cannabis businesses. That's the purpose of the first one. The other pending amendments, you know, they're going to be attached to bills that may or may not get there. But I did want to make you aware about the one that does still restrict taxpayer funds from being used to prosecute state level services, but the, the, uh, the U.S. House still blocks implementation of District of Columbia's marijuana uh, full regulation um, measure that passed a couple years ago, okay? So that's the appropriations amendment. So let's move on here. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking fast. I hope that is No, that, that, but Mayor Jane, yes. let's, let's just break it down very simple. CBD is still illegal, right? No, no, it is okay. not. That, that, that's someone it's asked me that. Of, so, if, 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 okay, if you want to just a brief description now, CBD is part of the cannabis plant, as is THC in about, I oh, don't know, no, how many, It's a, there's a debate as to how many other compounds, there's yeah, 60, yeah. 80, 100, 200, 300, whatever, they're called cannabinoids, many of them. So the top cannabinoids are THC and CBD, which is cannabidiol, all right? Cannabidiol is legal if it has been uh, extracted from hemp. Hemp and marijuana, we know are both cannabis, but hemp is defined as containing less than 0.3% THC. If, if they can get it down that low, then that's hemp, then that's legal, then CBD from that hemp is legal, okay? That's how that works. Yeah, Got so- it? What, Is that confusing? What, I hope so. <laughs> I hope it is confusing because it is. <laughs> Because it is very confusing. Yeah. Especially yeah, for us. That's the way it smoke. is. Especially the federal for government for you. smoke reefer. You know, it's very confusing. But anyways. But okay. Thank well, you. Let's Mary. check out the state of Ohio any, here. Any, this is what this is. follow up to what sorry? You, you know, any follow up of what you said so far. And yeah, excellent presentation, Tim has just said. Oh, if anybody has. I, I'd like to see the questions for the end, you know, just so I can yeah. get through this. So finish, but, you know, you, that's a pretty good thing, question. So I, I, I just wanted to make sure people understood CBD and marijuana is still illegal federally. No, as I said, CBD is not. Depends on how it is derived. Okay. There you go. Okay. That's okay. the that's the definition. Thank hemp you. was legal. Hemp was legalized in 2018. Mm -hmm. I could go through all that, but hemp was the production of hemp was legalized in the United States in 2018. Mm. We know there's not really any difference between the two, but the government has to tell us that there is. Mm. All right. Mm. All right. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Okay. I just want to cover Ohio. All right. This is Ohio. Now, um, I went here, I went to the, uh, there's a search engine on the uh, legislature's 
a website and I put into search terms or with several search terms on um, you know, the same ones, I guess, otherwise marijuana, marijuana with an H, you know, hemp and then cannabis. And I come up with really three relevant bills. All right. Uh, one, two in the house and one in the Senate. Um, the house ones, uh, I think the one that has decent chance of passing is HB 60. Uh, that's for children who have autism. Mm. Autism has been rejected by the medical board several times, but the advocates, um, they're probably some of the best advocates. They are very, very compelling in their stories about their children. Uh, and they've gotten the attention of uh, both a Republican and a Democratic legislator. And there's 15 co-sponsors. This has three hearings in committee. That may well, get to the desk of DeWine, I'll, I'll bet you he'll sign it if it, get, if it does. The other one is HB 210, and this is basically a full legal um, bill. It allows for, I think, the uh, uh, home growing of 12 plants. It expunges records. It's kind of like the Moore Act, but it defines plant quantity in terms of uh, home growing. Um, this one is very odd. It has zero co-sponsors, and it's but it's been referred to the Criminal Justice Committee, and it's had zero hearings. Yeah. Now, I've got the big question, why down there? Because, in fact, I was talking or, or emailing back and forth with, with um, um, Steve, that Steve Crusoe, this afternoon, and you can't find HB 210 by searching the Ohio Legislature website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find that very odd, and I find that's, it somewhat that's troubling. Totally, totally un. I mean, at least there's one sponsor usually. That's totally unprecedented. This is this is a, this is a weird issue. Uh, I yeah. can I could go into yeah. it right now, or I could proceed yeah. for one more slide. Please. But uh, the the issue is finding the bill in the search engine, the state search engine. All right. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't mm -hmm. you think that a bill that's been introduced, that e that's been assigned to committee, you should be able to search the, the legislature's website and find it? Because that's how most people are going to find bills. They're not necessarily going to know what the bill number is. Yeah. All right. Um, and I, I could see Steve, Steve could go into more technical detail in terms of what he found about this. But by and large, I'm really co confused and concerned why it's not a part of the search engine for all other bills, all right? And so and it doesn't appear on the search results. I, I stuck it in there because I knew it existed. It does not come from a search, all right? So those are the bills that I are, are um, really, I think, two viable bills in Ohio. Mm. I'm going to move on real quickly here to the next point, which is the decrim, decrims and ballot issues. Mary Jane, right? just, just quick, quick. You're saying viable as though that they are a potential of passing. I don't think 210 can pass. Um, if you can't get it to be appear in the search engine. Yeah, that's right. That's strike number one. Yeah. Now, the other one, the HB60, yeah, I think HB60 ultimately do. will pass. Um, I think just because the, the, the uh, autism is so compelling, the children are so compelling. We saw yeah. that in 2013 with um, the children that came out of Sanjay yeah. Gupta's um, yeah. um, move, uh, the CNN special about the children that had Dravet syndrome. You know, they, yeah. that was very compelling. Yeah. And so uh, I think that's the same thing with the kids with autism. And I think it's very needed. I think that, that cannabis from the spectrum of autism, from all the things that you, because it's a spectrum of disorders, I think it's, it, they make a very good argument. And I think it's uh, something that should happen. We, you know, children with Dravet syndrome can now get cannabis. You know? So I think that that's only fair for the, the autistic children as well. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now well, the please decrims. Continue, please. I'm sorry. All right. Pardon me? Please continue. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. All right, the decrims. Okay, well, I, I call these decrims for short. That's kind of what they call them themselves. And these are the ones that go into your local community and pass least penalty um, ballot issues. You know, they, they, they think the, uh, the possession up to 200 grams is legalized and there's no fine or no time if they're, you know, someone does get caught with possession of cannabis up to that amount. And that's, that's more than what state law is. And state law says, you know, there's a hundred dollar fine. So um, this is just bettering one, one step better than, 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 than because the high decrimmed in 1975 and it still, still has basically the same, same type of law. But these, these, are, these are two of the these people do advance the ball in the game because it really gets the message out there about that people are tired of provision. I think people are tired of it, and these people can resonate at the local level. And so, 20, they've got twenty-one 
I want to go back, 22 cities that they've covered that include Columbus. Now they didn't do this by ballot issue in Columbus, but we call a couple of years ago, they went towards, over to city council, city council agreed, they decrimmed. You know, so we have the same thing happen in Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, et cetera. There is actually a program, a, a program going on right now to get Akron on this list this fall. And so these people are very productive. Right now they have four issues pending. And I think by the end of the year, you'll probably see 10 or more. That's how good they are. I'm really proud of their work. And through this, they've got 27%. Not, not, this is not just with the the, the, the uh, decrim of 1970 that, that had the penalties lowered to you know $100 fine for I think 100 grams this um, these people will are covering 2.1 million Ohio citizens with this and uh, in 22 different cities and that's 27 percent of the state's population I think that's that that that's you know that may be moving the ball forward it, it's inching it forward but it's moving the ball forward nonetheless okay mm -hmm. rarely do these things fail yep. all right having said that Everybody's always going, well, what about a ballot issue? Because Bob will remember, I hope so, he remember dearly, you know, our, our wonderful Ohio Cannabis Rights Amendment that we fielded in 2013. Didn't we try two different times? I'm sorry? Didn't we try two different times? But, oh well. There have been a number of different ballot issues, but Bob and I were involved very, very closely Intimately. Intimately. with the Cannabis Rights Amendment, and that was 2013 and 14. Yes, yes, yes and I appreciate that effort as best as it could move forward. Yeah. It's not, uh, the, the statewide, uh, I don't think the statewide ballot issue is viable at this time. Yeah. I think that the, the, the signatures uh, rose uh, because I had a lot big voter turnout in what was that, 2018, I guess, which was elected mm -hmm. to mine. That's right. Uh, and so because so many people turned out, it raised the signatures required because it's a per 10 percent mm. of mm. whoever turned out for the governor's um um race in whatever that year that was so the governor's race was 2018 a bunch of people turned out and now the signature requirement is almost it was 450,000 which is huge we had 305,000 we thought was incredible obstacle you know 10 years ago and that has to be submitted if they're even possible to that that have to be submitted by june 30th that's not possible and so the, the signature gathering last year was uh, thwarted by COVID and the decrim people went to court and actually got the, uh, got a, uh, before, tried to get before the Supreme Court, but uh, the decision was remanded back to the appeals court. The appeals court ruled that signature gathering uh, really was basically not possible due to the COVID. COVID. And so after so Mary, that- Mary Jane, you, yes? you just, I mean, there, there is a legal process that must maintain, and we must always understand it. Can you describe that, or do you want to defer that for other later? Well, the the, the process is you 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 you, you bring a quick brushstroke of the process. Yeah, is please, you get a bunch of people together and you. Happen, second, second. Pardon me. In about 20 minutes, you know, say it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that you meant 20 seconds. I'm trying to do it in 20 seconds. No, no, no. But no, you just get some people together. You get initial thousand signatures. You get this. Those are certified for you to collect a larger amount uh, statewide. Uh, statewide, like they say, the, 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 the number now to meet uh, is 442,958 ballot signatures. You have to double that because you have to account for, you know, errors. And so you double that. That's, you can see that's almost a, a million signatures. Yeah. And uh, then you um, submit those to the uh, Secretary of State's office. And then you go through a whole process where they validate them. If you're lucky to get to the ballot, um, then you're certified for it. Well, there's another couple steps to go through that, you know, it was determined in 2015. Nonetheless, except for uh, Responsible Ohio with issue three in 2015, no one's ever made it to the ballot with a marijuana issue, a statewide ballot with a marijuana, marijuana issue. All right, and, and, um, was and, and issue three was defeated, were soundly defeated. Yeah, uh, MJ, 2015 was a landmark politically potential it didn't succeed yes right 
Well, it didn't succeed. No, it, 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 uh, um, but it issue, was issue three lost. But the people who were organizing issue three then went to the legislature, yes. Yes. and then they they were the ones that kind of pushed through HB five twenty three. Yeah, yeah. So, so to to continue our conversation on what community building is, <laughs> legislation action uh, may have many. Uh, uh, approaches, many approaches. We need to uh, understand that one stroke is not what's going to build community. We we are there every time, and and free press. Thank you. Free press is an institution, an, an institution that we have. And re rejoice in that. Rejoice in that we have that institution. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think we're getting close. We're all re already like eight thirty uh, to what we wanted to be. But I do have one. One. Mary Jane, are you done yet? Mary Jane. Sorry. Yes. Are you done yet? I can be. I'm, I'm yes. not trying to rush you. Do you want to mention what you talked about, what you found? When, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, please do. I'm, and, and, and we need to stay in contact on that. I'm very fascinated by what you found, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this go. I'm put my, um, well, I have a question for Mary Jane. Please. Yes. Uh, Mary Jane, uh, uh, you were continuing the story, uh, um, uh, but you got sort of interrupted a little bit. So yeah, it, 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 it went to court. It went to court, and uh, uh, how did the court rule? And and uh, because I heard something that they ruled that it was hard to get signatures or difficult to get signatures during COVID. So what happened after that? Yeah, well, what what happened was um, uh, Bill Schmidt and Chad Thompson were the were the plaintiffs or whatever you want to call it. I think it's the right thing to say. Um, to the to and they filed a, a lawsuit to allow them to collect signatures during the pandemic. And they thought that they should be able to do something online or something like that. And um, uh, federal judge Edwin Sargas from this district ruled in their favor. All right. But the, I believe the state appealed or somebody okay. appealed. I'm not sure it was this, somebody how, somehow it got appealed to, a, to an appeals court and the appeals court turned it down and then remanded it back to, to what the, you kept it at the appeals court decision which said, no, you can't do that. Well, then they appealed to the Supreme Court Okay, the Supreme Court said, no, we're going to let the lower court ruling stand. So it's kind of in this nebulous spot right now where I suppose if you if we got really post COVID and we were able to do it like we did before, you go, you know, hold your big events, you know, your Comfest, as an example, we collected right. the five to seven thousand signatures, I think, at Comfest in 2013 and 14, both years. You know, yeah. each year. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, so you get a lot of signatures there, but you know the way COVID changed everything. It, I think it's just really and, and and the other thing I didn't think I mentioned here. The other obstacle to putting anything on the ballot is the cost. It's going to cost you a minimum of twenty million dollars. And you see the, the I think that what that Zuckerberg thing he he spent like sixty million. You know, it's like. It's ridiculous, though. This is not a citizen process. It's a, it's a process for, again, the wealthy and the influential who have the ability to you know, put things Absolutely. on the ballot like that. Mm. And to contract afterwards. Yeah, mm. and then they get, then they get the, the, uh, the dispensaries right. and they get the uh, cultivator licenses, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Thank you, Mary Jane. You're doing great thank work. You. Yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I'll put one yeah. here, and there you, I am. All right. You there close I'm done. Yeah. You close it out because Mary Jane, thank you. You you are you doing MR, MGRN too? Do you have a, a show on there or no? Who oh, uh, Mary Jane or met myself? Yeah. <laughs> Who are you speaking to? Hey, hey listen. Uh, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, what I want to do is um, uh, just uh, yeah, my, uh, I'm I'm Tim Chavez. I uh, I'm a radio worker for 94.1 WGRN LP in Columbus, and uh, uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite uh, uh, producers is Julie Whitney Scott, and I invited her yeah. her to come here to the salon, 
and to uh, announce her uh, uh, her ninth, I think it's the ninth. Yeah, it's her, the ninth Columbus Black Theater Festival. At least ninth. <clears throat> No, it is the ninth. And uh, Julie's been working on this uh, theater for the last nine years. Uh, it's going to be July 9th, uh, July 9th through the 14th at the Abbey Theater in Dublin. And uh, we, uh, I would uh, ask everyone to uh, look at the website, Mind for God Productions, which I'll put onto the chat. Uh, and that'll show you the, how you can buy tickets in order to go to her theater, which is a wonderful theater and it's building up every year. And Julie's a great producer for the radio station and uh, she uh, has been managing this theater for uh, for this last past nine years. So um, it, it involves a lot of youth within the community and it is a local theater group, uh, groups actually of uh, thespians that are uh, practicing the craft. So listen, uh, we'd, uh, this would be a wonderful uh, event to go to since it's uh, we're at post COVID, but uh, I think uh, safety measures will be, precautions will, will be um, implemented at the theater. So keep that in mind and always listen to 94.1 WGRNLP in Columbus. And uh, we need volunteers. Uh, we always need a donation. A nickel or a dime helps a lot because we are a volunteer radio community radio station. There goes the word, Mark, community. Community radio station, which is a project of the Central Ohio Green Education Fund. And uh, so this radio station is um, uh, available to anybody that, that uh, uh that would like to uh, learn how to produce and would like to uh, either entertain themselves with radio as a hobby or as maybe a stepping block to actually be in radio. But I agree, uh, Tim, but no Nazis. No, no, oh, no. There's the, we got the, our, 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 our principles <laughs> and uh, I don't think they'd last very long with us to start with anyway. But, you know, I, I'm not worried about that. I don't want to invite anybody to come in and make application, and then we make our judgment from there. And that's really where it rolls. So uh, please uh, listen to the radio station. Donate a nickel or a dime. Uh, but definitely listen and spread the word that this radio station uh, exists here in Columbus. Has WGRN been on? Uh, four years now. Four. So we're moving towards the fifth. It's number five. So we're moving towards four. five. This is number four. This is a number five important for all. Uh, what do you call capitalist um, uh, corporation? But uh, we're not that. We're no. not even that. Not even. I close. mean, they survived two of three. They've survived two of three. You know, they they die, but public public radio has really been able to survive. It's it, let's do this. Let's mm -hmm. build this. Let's, you know, we are the public media. We are the public media. We got two stations. We got podcasts. We got, I mean, anything you want. We got it. I mean, and keep coming at oh. us with more technology. Oh, sure. More technology. Yeah, please, Stephen. Yes. So, Tim, how's that uh, solar project going? Did you get your permit yet? Tim put a solar project on his house and he's ready to crank it up. Come on, buddy. What's happening? He was uh, having problems. That's right. Uh, uh, nothing, really. Uh, the system's up and running. <laughs> the system's up and running, and but I still need to get permission from AEP. There you go. <laughs> so, uh, but that's that's uh, a long, that's, that's rolling. Working. So. But it is work. Yeah, it is. Well, yeah, definitely. Yes, yeah, yeah. nice. So we're going to open a floor for people to chit chat or get in if anybody has any other questions. Well, I do. You have, have to open your mics up. I won't mute you. It's up to you. Just be civil and. Stephen, I do have one other issue. If Len, okay, sorry. Lynn is around. I don't know if Lynn is, but I do. Lynn's, want Lynn Stan. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. I love Lynn Stan, but no, Lynn. From <laughs> um, I want to just present this. I'm, I'm sort of of opinion that we need to uh, not end with a downer. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> Quinn. But share, yeah. share this. Because she was beautiful. I'm telling you that right now. And uh, I know her. I've known her since she was young. Um, that's not it. Let me get to this point. Lynn, Lynn's last name, you keep saying Lynn. Does she have a last name? No, Lynn. We have a Lindsay Park in the participants list, but that's not who you're talking about, right? Lynn Stan is good. Okay, okay. Well, you want, well, when you get done, if Lynn wants to talk, Lynn, if you can hear us. This sand is like solid. Do you see this at all? I don't see. Uh, we're seeing a crisis hotline. Is that what you're wanting to show? Yeah, that's that's one thing. But uh, I, I wonder if I can share that to you. One. Okay, let's yeah. try this first. Yeah. This is um, we're 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 really losing a losing a lot of young activists. Um, we're losing a lot of old activists, okay? Um, I'm not saying everybody is like freaking out or nothing, but there is support everywhere. Mental health is a standard. And this is a great resource. If anybody wants it, for any which way you're going, we got it. Um, please share your concern, okay? Please share your concern. I do want, did we show this one? No, this one is what I wanna show uh, to end. No, actually, I wanna show this one to end. Let's see. Do we, uh, ah. This is one I'm going to have to share because the other one is gone. Okay, this is one I want to share. My name is Ann Whitehead and uh, coming from you live here from South Louisiana. We're both with the Loe La V camp, which is the resistance camp down here in South Louisiana. And we're fighting the Bayou Bridge pipeline, which is the tail end of the Dakota Access Pipeline. It's set to go through 700 of our waterways, including the Atchafalaya Basin, which is the largest natural swamp in North America. And it's also home to um, thousands of species, including the once endangered black bear, all kinds of beautiful birds. So we're trying to protect that waterway, including uh, Bayou Lafouche, which provides drinking water to 300,000 people, including all of the United Home Nation. This pipeline is going through North Dakota, where I live at, all the way through the um, Standing Rock area, and went through bulldozed old burial grounds, and um, not caring, just went, go ahead, go ahead and did it. So uh, that's another thing that really what brings me here is to actually stop the end of this uh, black snake that went through my my state. I didn't wake up and say, "This is what you know." I want to spend the rest year of my life fighting. I love the swamp. I'd love to be out here fishing in the swamp right now. That's what I wanted to be doing, you know. But uh can't fish in this. And if there's gonna be anything left for our kids to be able to fish in, then this is what I gotta do. I'm not a rich person. I'm not gonna leave them no vast fortune. All I have is the common goods that we all have, you know. So it's my job, I think, I feel like to take care of it so they'll have it, you know them and my grandkids too. I don't understand why anybody would think anything differently. So, I mean, as you can get a little closer, you can see where the deforestation is happening. They 
didn't look into how this this precious forest, this precious swampland is never going to come back to the way it was. That's it. You missed us? I ever take a picture to call the cops. This is the easement. This is Bayou Shane that we're on right here. Those big black things, those are floaters. And what they do is they make a big ditch, right? They put the pipe on like a rotation and they have those attached to them. And then when they get it all welded and laid out, they cut those and the floaters come off and they restack them and the pipe falls down into the ground. And the pipe has cement all over this, all over it makes it real heavy, except for the welds where it leaks. Okay, I'm just. Yeah, it's probably some kind of methane bubbles or something. There's others. This is a fun thing. Look at this. How do you defund the police? Ah. How do you defund it? You refund it, right? You don't just defund, you're refunding, okay? You're reestablishing experiences. Here you go. Right here. So, okay. Stephen, are we good? Do you want to talk a little bit more? I want to stop sharing. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, Cheryl, I used to converse with her on Facebook occasionally, the woman that was featured in the video that Mark shared. And, uh, she was on it, buddy. I mean, I don't, I, they probably kicked her off of Facebook, I would doubt. Um, I haven't seen her on my friends list in a while or any posts from her directly, but she's getting the word out and she's doing a lot of great work down there. And it's un unbelievable what they're doing to the swamps and everything. And but uh, anybody, we can, uh, Lynn Stan, do you want to get on and talk or let's open it up, open the floor up for a little while? People have questions or things they want to say or yeah, issues they want to bring up. Mike's open. And if you can share anything about the community festival, I know we had that update last time, but anything? Did, are you there? Um, it is going to be here. I'll turn on some light. Um, yeah, please. Thank you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry for you. Inclusion. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was, um, yes, well, Convest is happening. It's going to be virtual, which means that it's going to be a um, an online show for, um, for 12 to 7 um, for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Some of it is will be some workshops and, and it's stuff. And then there'll be some that's kind of live and never been seen and, and whatever. But I think what, you know, what I expressed last time is that, Compass is really bringing, building an archive, and it really needs all the community orgs to put their information back to Compass so that they can put it up on the website about the history and the orgs that had received, you know, grants and whatnot. And this is not something that's going to be over once we get through this one. This is something that Compass really wants to do it, as it moves to its 50th. Okay. So it is happening. Um, we encourage people just to set up your own um, viewing parties. Um, and it's kind of, it's, it's happening and not happening. <laughs> Are the uh, you got submission videos still being accepted or is that deadline passed now? No, keep submitting them. Absolutely keep submitting them, even if they can't. Right. That was okay. one of our questions last time was what what is... What is the deadline for a, a, uh, a workshop of political nature? Well, that part I really can't answer because quite honestly, I've been kind of confused by that whole process. Yeah, so yeah. if you really do have something, reach out to Julie Kurtzenberger or reach out to Daryl Mendelson. Okay, I really have not been able to kind of keep up on that part. Can you like give their uh, contact information in the chat or no? You can also just write videos at Compass. Videos at Compass. Okay, and I and or anybody can reach me and and ask for their phone number. So, but again, it's an ongoing thing. Maybe not won't be part of the twelve to seven yeah, one yeah, of the yeah, three yeah. days, but absolutely, it's an ongoing thing. Compass is trying to do. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. We're trying to build a community of knowledge, right? Absolutely. And um, and really to educate because, you know, I just, we did a yard sale in Old Town, so I've been going through a lot of stuff and boy, um, including a whole box of free press magazines. But um, <laughs> it's just, there's a whole story out there that unfortunately just keeps, it keeps getting lost. So I encourage organizations to. So, so you've been a long time resident in the, the, in the Near East, so-called Near East. Um, what do you think of the trolley experience that's going to come coming into your place? What it, what do you think of the Parsons redevelopment, Oak Parsons redevelopment? What's going on? You've been there for before that even happened. Yeah. I certainly did marry into it, and I see Jonathan Beard's on the call too, so he could really answer. Yeah, um, but I want your answer. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that what I really see is that um, just all the things that we keep seeing on in the neighborhoods, that we don't really look at who's here. We think that you can just change what a neighborhood is for, mm -hmm. and that different incomes will now be the savior of those. Um, I've never really liked that attitude, and that's been really a large problem, and when it comes to developers coming from outside. Um, I think the trolley barn is going to really, um, <laughs> I think it will cause a lot of activity and I hope that it's a positive activity that the neighborhood will like. I hope that it is um, food that is affordable to people that can walk to it. Um, and I hope that it doesn't just become dest a destination, that it really becomes you know, kind of a part of the community. Um, we've lost so much of our small businesses around the community. Um, and I hope that this is one that will be of a small business mindset, not necessarily just the biggies. Um, so the, and, and to see the developments, I mean, it just, it, it's, I, that's the part, that's my kind of my reaction. Thanks for asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. And, and Jonathan wanted to get in and, and we will let him in as well because you, you invited his well. And his experience is very important. Um, I grew up, I grew up there from two years old until 17 years old. I was at Fulton and Linwood. And it has changed, yes, the community has changed, but defining community, what is the next def uh, reality? What is the next boom of this Main Street? Because um, Main Street has been de a derelict of city planning for so many years, 40 plus years, 40 plus years. Um, they would say other, they would say other. So Jonathan, please. Yeah, please. thank you very much, Mark and, and Lynn. Um, Appreciate the conversation I've been listening to. Well, I'm um, happy and sad at the same time for the Near East Side. I think um, one of the things that I love about the Near East Side that I moved here for was the diversity of, of incomes and diversity in people. And I think a, a spirit of um, just a spirit of inclusion. And, um, you know, so it's good to see things happening. Many people may not know that the Trolley Barn Project, we called it Franklin Park Trolley Barn, was a project of the Columbus Compact, which I ran. Um, I remember we um, had a um, we had a couple planning charrettes. I think we did one at Central Community House when we were asking people what the project should look like, who it should serve, who it should serve, etc. It was very much going to be a very a neighborhood project that was going to be inclusive. Um, I remember we were doing this neighborhood charrette, and my little four year old son was there at the time. We just kind of going around the room, popcorn style, ask you know what do people want. My little four year old stopped popped up and said, a sports bar. And um, so the, the, there's going to be a Columbus Brewing Company, um, uh, you know, brewery there, which, which is along the same lines. You know, so I'd love to see it happen. Um, I'll tell you a little backstory about how Brad DeHayes got involved in it. So at the compact board meeting, Boyce Safford, who was the mayor's, um, former mayor's deputy chief of staff and then the mayor's development director under uh, Coleman, he was on my board as a city representative. And so the board was going through and giving the final board approvals to take some actions. Um, and after the meeting, both boys pulled me aside and said, a project like this, you really need to talk to the mayor's office about. So I'm like, you know, what the fuck, okay. Um, so I made an appointment to meet with um, Mike, um, 
Sexton, who was down there at the time. He was in, heading the community affairs part of the mayor's office. And so I went in, Mike was walking out, and um, he said, I want you to meet with Shannon Harden, who was down there. So I met with Shannon, you know, showed him our little, you know, it was a PowerPoint. Uh, Boyce had told me, make it, make it a big number when you go down there. Well, our project was $9.6 million, and that's what I showed them. $9.6 million. There was no ask for it. It was um, 52 units of um, condos starting at $140,000 on the south side of Oak Street, um, a vacant lot there, and, and then the west side of um, Kelton. East and West Sides of Kelton, um, and um, let's see, and then across you know across the street it was the market concept. The only difference in our plan and what Brad Hayes is now proposing is that the far eastern side of the trolley barn lot, there's a one-story building there. We had housing there because we couldn't envision enough commercial uses there, so we had that as apartments as well. Um, other than that, the concept is exactly the same. So John, remember, thank yeah. Thank Thank you. Thank you for really pushing for that uh, potential. Yeah. This is becoming, I mean, I'll be there. I'll be there. Yep, me too. And the thought was this will be a place that people want to spend three or four hours on a Saturday. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. There'll be like, you know, outdoor um, chess sets and that sort of thing and, and just activities on the grounds to be a, you know, a little bandstand so people can come play acoustic because we're in a neighborhood. Um, just a, a fun place for the neighborhood to convene and be able to buy stuff. Um, you know, we priced it $9.6 million because, you know, put a lot of money into it. You got to get a lot of money back out, which means your rents have to be high. Um, ours was $9.6 million. So it was priced to be very affordable. So um, the development on the other side of all, where mm -hmm. is that? And who is funding that? And where is that coming from? Is that a appropriate, so, I'm not appropriate, affordable, uh, type of housing or what's going on? I kind of can't see how it would be because it's a $30 million project now. Very big, very big. Yeah, it's 100 units or something like that, 104 units. So they got twice the density that we had proposed. Um, but anyway, I met with Shannon. So affordability is an issue with- I, su uh, I suspect it will be, but I don't know for sure. Issues, yeah. Um, yeah, so I met with Shannon and the project was in environmental court at the time. Yeah. And so I went with the Franklin Park Civic Association to the next court hearing. And this was three weeks after I met with Shannon. So I'm sitting there in, in the back with the neighborhood group. And Rick Pfeiffer walked in. Mm -hmm. He went up to the desk and whispered something to the assistant city attorney who was sitting up there. The hearing started and she stood up and said, Your Honor, the city's re revised its position. We no longer want a court appointed receiver for the property. Instead, we want fines of $1,000 a day to accumulate to the city. And the interesting thing, I walked in the hearing that day and Mark Froelich was sitting there. Um, Mark was a former judge and used to run... Um, Columbus Urban Growth Corp, which is the city's development com company. And when I walked in, he waved to me and told me to come over. And he had a brand new manila file folder in his lap saying Franklin Park Trolley Barn. He said, um, John, I'm about to be appointed receiver today. I know you've got a contract on the property. I look forward to working with you. Um, so anyway, we walked in and, and inserted the city as a, um, as a creditor in the property. And Judge Hale was mad as hell. He's cussing up a storm. What the fuck is this? We've been working down this path for the last nine months. And here you come in the last fucking month. We're all ready to go with this kind of shit. I mean, he's just cussing up a storm in the courtroom. Funny as hell. They said, you know, you're the, um, you're the appellant or plaintiff, whatever the term is. As you wish, fines it to $1,000 a day. Um, but I'm retaining jurisdiction. And we're having another hearing in 30 days. Walk back in. And 30 days later, I'm, again, I'm sitting back with the, um, with the neighborhood group. And the bailiff comes out. Is there a Mr. Beard here? I raise my hand. Yeah. Judge Hale wants to see you in the cham in chambers. So I walk back there. And again, he's cussing up a storm at the city attorney who walked in with an appraisal value that two times the appraisal that we had used to justify our purchase price of the property. And he's cussing up a storm again. Who the fuck asked for this? I didn't ask for this. You know, where the fuck has this come from? And um, so anyway, he needed me back there so he could call the Bob Weiler company who I got an appraisal from and have them confirm to him that they stand by price my appraisal. So we did that. And um, so what was obvious, I had presented this project to the city and the city had plans. You know, what I think is they thought this property, this project shouldn't be black hands. Honestly, that's what I think. And um, so about, you know, so housing market so, crash hit and that kind of thing. Yeah. And, so, um, John, so Jonathan, the, the, yeah. the general uh, interest, not the interest, but um, how how do you perceive 
development in the Berkeley Main Street to uh, let's go all the way into Parsons Main Street of, of Main Street. Do you, do you see yourself as a, a proponent of that or someone that has stepped back from that? Well, we've definitely, I've definitely stepped back from it. I'm not at the compact anymore. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's definitely, um, it's for people who are not from the community. It's for a different set of people yeah. that the city wants to be here, um, who are whiter and wealthier. Um, you know, there's been a long time for 30, 40 years, they've been talking about when the Near East Side will, would flip and, and become the, you know, kind of the high-end neighborhood that I think everybody has, has known that it would be. Yep. And um, I tend to think it needed a black mayor and a black majority black city council to justify it. Um, those are just my, those are just my musings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at least uh, those that recognize the so uh, the east side of Columbus as being critical, critical to the development of Columbus. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the buildings, I mean, if you really look at the buildings on Brighton Road, it's where the fucking white folks fled when the floods were coming. They came to that hill, and that's where they came. Um, yeah. uh, and 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 now it, it is a reconstructions going on. Uh, yeah, d d uh, economic. Uh, what's the word? Economic shoo, uh, desolation. Desolation. Yeah. Desolation. I mean, they they per particularly left areas of the city, urban areas across the country, they left them to bear. They, and they called it urban renewal. They called it urban renewal. And that's where they tore up. They tore it up. They killed the whole culture. That, yeah. Well, not the whole. I'm sorry. <laughs> we call junk. And culture is hard to kill. And it's still there. And, and it's happening. But, yeah. but Jonathan, the city's taken over that. Uh, Sorry, Born, the city's taken that over now. They they push us out basically. That was their intent. They push us out. Yeah. And um, you know, I I harbor no bad feelings with Brad DeHaze who's doing the project. We actually sold him his land across the street that we owned because he needed to leverage the historic credits for the trolley barn. Um, so no bad feelings for him at all. It'll just end up being a very different project than um than we would have done as a nonprofit entity. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So. But stay your nose in up in it. Yep. Yep. Always. Yeah. So the other piece, and I, if I could share this, is about um, April 29th, a group of um, black community leaders yeah. um, got together and formed what's called the Columbus Police Accountability Project. Yeah. This involves a lot of people who have been in the space of police reform for years. Yes. Um, so we formed as a project, not a new organization. And our mission short term is to have the Department of Justice come in and do an investigation of Columbus Police, a pattern and practice investigation with the intent of having them determine again that the city's engaged in unconstitutional, unlawful um, policing. But this time with the goal of having them um, put Columbus, have them sue the city and put Columbus Police under court supervision for a period of time. Um, the day before we made the announcement, and we weren't we weren't private about you know, our intent. The day before, Mayor Genther got up there and said he'd asked the Department of Justice to come in and um, do a review of the Columbus Police of policies and procedures and best practices. Um, we met with uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Ohio. He called us in last week, um, so a group of us went down there, met with him, and um, you know he was kind of winking and nodding through the whole thing, things that he couldn't say, but he was um, pretty clear that he, he supported what we were doing. He told us the mayor's initiative, you know, he's talked to people in DC and the decision will be made in DC. The mayor's um, effort involved the COPS Community Oriented Policing um, Program, which is in the Department of Justice. Hmm. And ours involves the Civil Rights Division within the, um, within the Department of Justice. So he said he had some concern um, you know, at some point the two will go head to head down, to, you know, in DC and, and the department will make a decision probably one or the other way. 
you know, our position is that, you know, the city is a rich city. Our cops are well-trained, they're just undisciplined. Um, they don't need policies and procedures training that's been done before. The fact is we've got a rogue um, set of cops and we've had them for a long time and they're, you know, they're not disciplined and not called in check. And so oversight is needed. That the settlement agreement negotiated in, in 2002 was insufficient and too short and that we really want the pattern of practice investigation. So our next step as a group is to um, try to get the ear of, um, I forgot her name right now. Um, I forgot her name. The, the, uh, the woman that heads up the civil rights um, division of the Department of Justice. Vanita and Mary, Gupta. Yeah, Vanita Gupta, thank you. Yeah. And try, try to get her ear uh, because both so of these- She's not a divisions, new her position, but she's, yeah. She's yeah. pushing out. She's trying to do her thing. So yep, yep. Uh, let's try to work with her. Let's try exactly. to get her done. Get her done. Get her done. Yep. So she got our original letter, um, but we're trying to get more personal contact with her now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've reached out to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who Bob and Suzanne know were here, you know, three or four years ago on our behalf about um, the voting rights issues in Columbus. So I reached out to her on Friday, um, try to get a personal um, contact, personal communication going with of Anita Gupta. Um, so if anybody has any insights or paths to that, because um, she oversees both the cops part and the civil rights um, litigation department. So, you know, these will be funneling up through her and then she would make, we're presuming she would make the recommendation, Mary Carlin. Um, you know, we do not have confidence in Joyce Beatty's um, um, conviction on this and her ability to cross Andy or something like that. Um, Thinking maybe we'll ask Tim Ryan as a Senate, Senate candidate, uh, trying to work through our maybe state reps to put pressure on Joyce, try to put you know a lot of people around Joyce um, telling her the same thing mm -hmm. that um, you know support our pattern practice investigation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So so um, we know we need to have good relations. That's that's the core of all community where our focus tonight is community and yep. community building community uh, training for that community um very important for us to have relational uh expressions whatever mm -hmm. that is i mean okay. whether it's positive negative we got them. we got them. if if uh the new what about the new chief has has have we as free press uh, asked or WGRN or WCRS asked for an uh, exclusive interview of the new chief? And that's that's just a question. But John, you you have done so much work locally. Um, you got us involved with so much that was going on in the Main Street development. Um, how, how do you see community moving forward? How do you see it? How, I mean, historically we're here, now we're here. You know, I mean, we're, we can't, we can't say, let's go back to the Poor People's March on Washington. We can't go back to, even, we can't even go back to May 29 or 30 of 2020 because mm -hmm. they're already erasing that history they're erasing it i mean yeah. how do we how do we sustain community i'll tell you um in my mind um truth comes before reconciliation so one <laughs> thing we're doing is capturing people's stories um both from 2020 about the protests as well as other stories related to police and kind of smaller issues mm -hmm. um i'll tell you i've been incredibly heartened by the, the just the good nature of all the people that have come and given us testimony. Um, we have white folks from the, um, who were involved in the protest last summer who come to us and, and thank us for giving them the ability to tell their story. And they're saying things like, you know, I haven't told anybody this because I don't want my story to overshadow the larger story of policing black folk. And this, I mean, just incredibly um, generous with their, with their spirits and so forth. Uh, we had a um, black man whose son was murdered mm. and um, the police wouldn't investigate it as a homicide. 
spent thousands and thousands of dollars of his own money hiring private investigators, hiring um, um, uh, friend, um, forensic examiners, getting the process, getting the um, coroner to say, yeah, we thought it was homicide too, but the detectives kept telling us it was suicide. Um, getting, you know, he got witness statements and, and, um, and you know, was willing to put $5,000 of his own money down to Crime Stoppers and the city blocked the, you know, Crime Stoppers to talk to the police when the police blocked it. Um, and there's so many people out there who want justice for their families, who want justice for the community. And so to be, you know, you're hearing all these stories of, of abuse and, and, and hardship, but it's just, you know, you're just sometimes overwhelmed by how good some of the people in, in Columbus are. Oh my God, the social norm, the social yeah. norm is expected to be negative, but it's not. Oh my yeah. God, Columbus is like beautiful. It is a it is it is a mountain. It is a mountain. That's why we don't get. I mean, that's why we don't get hit by any of the storms because it goes around us. Because yeah. they know they can't mess with us. Yeah. Even the weather can't mess with. Us. If I can give you one quick story, so this gentleman whose son got killed, yeah. he investigated and basically he found out who the murderers are. He's got text messages between them. Um, yeah. he's got people. I got that going on right now myself. I got okay. that. Yeah, go he's ahead. got witnesses. He's got witnesses that were willing to testify that were petrified, yeah. um, that the police intimidated. Um, and he went by the house where his son was murdered one day. Saw some people walking out of, from a car to the house and stopped and asked them if they heard anything about the house. They said they heard a young man commit suicide there. And he told them his story that he was dead. Da da da. And he just said, "You know, would you mind if you let if I walked in the house and saw where my son's last breaths were taken?" And these incredibly good-hearted people, you know, let him in. They didn't know him from Adam. Let him into their house. He told us, you know, he's telling, he's crying, you know, just tears streaming down his face. Um, looks over the fridge and sees a bullet hole. And you see the bullet hole. He's got laminated photographs of the, of the uh, murder scene in the police investigation that he gave to us. Um, this happened five years ago. I mean, this man is carrying this stuff. But he sees a bullet hole that had never been repaired in this rental property. And um, couldn't get it off his mind. Three days later, he went back, saw a different woman in front of the house, asked if she had heard about that he had come by. She knew the whole story. And he said, I can't get this bullet hole out of your mind, out of my mind. Would you mind if I um, um, take a ladder to the side of the house and look at it? And she helped him with the ladder. You know, again, no problem. And um, so he's looking at the bullet hole. Police had never found the bullet. And he turns around and looks at the house next door and sees the bullet that most likely went through his son's brain in the wall of that house that the police could never find oh, and he said he almost fell off the ladder and he's you know just crying and trembling and digs a you know digs a bullet out um by himself to take to the police mm -hmm. um but it's just like I, i'm just overwhelmed sometimes by by these stories i hear of how good people are um you know we had white folks coming in about the protests talking about how they were purposeful about putting their white bodies in front of um black protesters yeah and you know upsetting out about getting pushed out of the way um, so the police could get the rest of the black ball. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's just, when you talk about community, you know, it's all there and we got to be able to, you know, tell these stories and celebrate that because, um, you know, yeah. there are a lot of good people out there. Oh, it's, there's so much beauty, so much beauty. Yeah. And we need to uh, really experience the pain, though, of mm -hmm. so many people. I mean, we need to be, be able to uh what is it uh, tell the story there, there's the term called story holders out there right now and we need to let them tell it yeah there's so many people that are have stories we need to be able to get them uh to be tellers so that's and cool. that's where wgrn wcrs and all those Hopefully, we can create uh, the avenues, and and if they write, let's go. W, uh, you know, the free press. Yeah, and thank you to the free press and John Lasker. Um, he wrote a great article about our initiative last week. There you go. Yeah. You 